On this episode, we discuss Sony and Microsoft having a gaming partnership, SpaceX partnering with themselves, and Joe Rogan partnering with AI. Or at least that's what you'll believe soon enough. Plus, we look at the concept of the Pixel 3a and brainstorm what an iPhone version of this would look like. This and more in this week's show. I'm Austin from PopXCast, a pop culture podcast part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other awesome geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. This is the official GunnaGeek.com show. Here, we're a bunch of geeks talking about geeky things. Each week, we run down the latest news and happenings in the world of geek. These are your hosts for the show, Steven. But what if I'm in the mood for a T-Swift story? Chris. I've heard the X is going to give it to you. And SP. That's how we roll on Gonna Geek on Monday night. We get crazy! Gunna Geek Productions presents the official GunnaGeek.com show. Welcome to episode 287 of the official GunnaGeek.com show. I am Stephen John Drew, and I am pleased to say that Stargate Pioneer is here today. Please, Stephen, call me SP, and yes, I am back and ready to go for a great show tonight. Just you and me. We're without the new married guy. That's absolutely true. By the way, a lot of people get mad because I pretty much yell at the start of this show. So I'll go ahead and calm it down, bring it down to the pace of our yeah. special guest that we've got, which is none other than the wonderful Suncast. Hi. How's yes. it going? For those of you not familiar, Suncast is our residence recurring guest. Well, one of them. And he is here to fill in for the married guy because the show just wouldn't be the same if we didn't have one non-married guy. So since Chris Farrell is away, figuring out what he's going to do now that he's been kicked off the show, uh, we do have Suncast here to take that unmarried seat. Suncast, why don't you take a moment here to plug or promote yourself because... People might not be familiar if they haven't checked out the show where they can usually find you at. You can usually find me doing stuff behind the scenes over at uh, GFQ Network, gfqnetwork.com. We have a few shows on there. Uh, what the Tech with Paul Therat. If you like tech stuff, uh, we got an awesome show where he talks about a lot of the current stuff that's out there. If you like wrestling, we have Matt Men. I know that e AEW is a big thing now. And a lot of people like news, and we got tons and tons of AEW news on Matt Men Pro Wrestling. So check that out. And then follow me on Twitter, at Suncast. It's spelled S-U-N-K-A-S-T. I have to say, there are two shows that you've got over there that are just, like, amazing, absolutely incredible, really handsome fellows on there. One is called Better Podcasting. One is called the TheGunnaGeek.com show. Uh, you can find, find that over there uh, on GFQ as well. Uh, okay, so we kind of hinted to it at the beginning. Yes, the wonderful, our co-host... Here on the show, Chris Farrell did get married this past week, so we thought that we would just take a moment here, because he's not here right now, to congratulate him, so that if he doesn't watch this episode, we can just come off as total a-holes for not congratulating him, because this is probably the only time we'll ever mention it. But yes, congratulations to Chris Farrell and his wonderful wife for getting married this past week. You two are incredible people, and we wish you the best, although, truth be told, I will say that I think a Suncast Chris Farrell relationship might have been a little bit better. I don't know. I'm just saying. Going for the non main character ship there, I see. <laughs> no, seriously. Congratulations, Chris Farrell. We don't know uh, how long he'll be away. He has given us a number that, that we have argued with that, that Star Stargate Pioneer and I have said, no, you should take some more time. So we'll see when he returns. Well, I heard he's not coming back until he grows more hair. <laughs> well, I will say that we have actively removed him from our conversations, so he doesn't know that we're recording tonight. That is a fact. So congratulations, Chris Farrell, and to your wonderful wife as well. And I do want to say that Chris will return at some point. I was joking. He's not actually fired, but we'll see what, what it is. We'll see when it is. We're encouraging him to take the time that he needs to be a newlywed, enjoy that special, special time, and get away from these handsome faces.
This first news point is something that we've actually kind of touched on before, and it's all to do with cloud gaming. Yes, if you haven't checked out that previous episode or the other one or the other one, uh, in the past, we have talked about the concept of cloud gaming and specifically how Google announced a month or so ago that they were going to be getting into cloud gaming. Well, it looks like the pressure might be on because this past week, Sony and Microsoft announced that the two companies are going to partner on new innovations to enhance customer experiences in their direct-to-consumer entertainment platforms and AI solutions. Under this agreement, the two companies are going to explore joint development of future cloud solutions in Microsoft Azure to essentially create more streaming game content. This is really interesting to see because for a long time, Sony has been saying, no, we won't partner with anybody. We won't even do any of that modern uh, cross-platform. They've kept their silos up. And now all of a sudden, Sony and Microsoft are saying that they're exploring this concept together. Now, why I find this interesting is because, number one, what I said, this comes on the heel of that Google announcement. But the other thing as well is this perhaps Microsoft flexing their muscle. And I'm not talking their gaming muscle. This reference is Azure. Microsoft has a pretty good cloud backbone otherwise. There's all sorts of services mm -hmm. that are based on the Microsoft Azure platform. This is a big part of their book of business. And is this something that Sony was really looking to utilize that? And Microsoft said, well, if you're going to go ahead and explore that and we're going to try to support you, maybe we need to make this a little bit more firm of an agreement and try to uh, kind of put uh, Sony into a corner because where are they going to turn? Are they going to turn to Google? No, Google is also doing their own thing. So it's really interesting for me to see this come up when you consider the silo that ha that Sony's created for their gaming platform. Suncast, you're all yes. about cloud stuff and I know that you game all the time. That's not true. Uh, but what do you think about this from like the tech perspective? Because you are all into this sort of uh, I'll call it server stuff. It's not really server stuff, but you are kind of into that. Yeah, uh, this is kind of an interesting, but maybe it makes sense partnership. So yeah, it's it's it, they're definitely doing a me too. I can get into that that gamer cloud arena as well, like <laughs> what Google is doing. But I, I, you know what? I think Google might have a little bit of an edge here, where they've already got quite a bit of experience doing gaming in the cloud. They've already had several other similar products where they've tried doing something like that. Not that Microsoft hasn't had some stuff, but I think Google has had a little bit more success in delivering software over the cloud, whereas Microsoft may not have had as much of a success. They've got some stuff that they've done in the past. Like I think it was called OnLive that they once did or something similar to that, where they had some sort of uh, PC or gaming in the cloud, but it really didn't quite work that well so i think it makes sense for them to actually partner with sony because sony does have some good success with having stuff in the cloud such as uh playstation view yeah no that's that's a good point and i don't actually know what their technical infrastructure is for that right now do you have any idea like is it microsoft azure or azure however you want to pronounce I it i don't know without checking on that okay Stargate Pioneer, I know that we've briefly talked on here about cloud gaming and you've got some concerns given bandwidth limitations and whatnot. Do you have more confidence now that these two are partnering together? I don't think that these two partnering together are going to solve the bandwidth problem. I think that's going to be largely a point of service with the ISPs themselves. And while some major markets are getting some phenomenal speeds, they're getting that fiber speed and the broadband cable has upped their broadband speeds because of the competition. You still have markets that are completely underserved and you're going to start to see this sort of cloud-based gaming catch on more and more in the areas where the speed of the internet is appropriate for these games. But in those areas where you don't have the availability, like right now, I don't have anything better than 15 down and 10 up. That's what I'm living on. 
and it's really? just not enough. Ooh. Yeah, there, there's nothing better around. Well, it, I think it's more than 15 down. I think it's like 50 down and uh, 15 up. It's not good enough to do 4K cloud-based gaming. Now, now to say that, what's interesting here is you can go cross-platform. You know, if they include Microsoft with Xbox and PC, and if they include Sony, then you're going to be able to on three of the major points of gaming, whether it's a PC gaming or if it's a box gaming, whether it's PS or Xbox, you're going to be able to interface at some point into the different servers. And these uh, broadband or broad games, what are they called? World games or whatever, where you're in a world and, and you can fight anybody else in them. I think those are going to grow in popularity because you're going to be able to go between PS4 and Xbox and PC, and you're going to see a delineation of the haves and the have nots, because there's going to be some systems that are going to be able to handle the game a little bit better at the actual player level, at the machine level, better than others for rendering or for throughput or anything like that. So you're going to see some haves and have nots. Mm -hmm. Now, when is this really going to catch on? I say within five years, you're going to have a large enough presence that it's going to be economically viable. I mean, in the meantime, it's going to be a hard push because it is the way of the future. Yeah, I, I'm interested more now now that this is happening because Google was kind of on their own. They obviously don't have a history on what sort of products they're going to focus on. That was the big question. What are they focusing on? But when you've got Microsoft and Sony, two big players of modern current gaming, console gaming, it's really interesting to think about what that partnership could do. But I, I still remain skeptical. I will say that I am still skeptical, but time will tell. People like me have the bandwidth to do it. People like SP, maybe not. Uh, and I think that that's a really important factor to consider that there are there's such different going to markets. Be caveats, though, there's there, there's going to be pros and cons to anything like this. That's that's well, true. If they, if they want to maximize the profits on any given game, they're going to have to have the max max available players that are in it. And if they want to do in-game purchases, is that going to go to the game, or is there going to be a cut on whatever system that you're using to play the game? I mean, think of the money ramifications when you're doing this cross-platform. Did you say the end game, like the Avengers end game? Is that what you said? I said oh. end game, but oh. yeah, well, let's, talk, let's talk end game because I'm all about that. You've only seen it once, right? Yeah, we don't need to talk about end game. That was so a month ago. <laughs> Moving on to the next news point here. We will go to another game, and that game is space exploration. And we've got something come out of SpaceX, right? We do. This is just keeps on getting better and better. So I spied an article on space.com by Mike Wall on Saturday, May 18th, 2019, which was titled SpaceX is building a Starship rocket prototype in Florida 2. And 2 is T-O-O, -O, so as well. So this is some of the quotes from the article. SpaceX is doing simultaneous competing builds of Starship in Boca Chica, Texas, and Cape Canaveral, Florida, Elon Musk said in a tweet on Tuesday, May 14th. Both sites will make many Starships. This is a competition to see which location is most effective. Answer might be both, Elon Musk said in another tweet that same day. Any insights gained by one team must be shared with the other the other team not required to use them, he said in yet another tweet. So he's doing a lot of tweeting here. So the Texas built Starship prototype, which SpaceX calls the Starhopper, may resume testing later this month. Ars Technica recently reported, citing highway closure information, which was reported by the Brownsville Herald. So exciting things. First of all, you've got SpaceX building not one, but two or having two teams building starship prototypes and they're competing against each other and then they're sharing all their cool information elon has it going on so if he runs into a problem with one of the uh, ways forward then he can go to the other team and say hey what do you got for me that would solve that problem and then it just launches it ahead it's a great way to do things if you can afford to do it but redundant development is quite expensive too. So I don't know how he's funding this guy. Either way, this is exciting. He's really pushing it forward. 
Plus, I really like Bocchini. That's what you said, right? That is exactly not what I said, but I'm glad you took it that way. Okay. Um, maybe I misheard that. I don't know. I'm hungry. Uh, okay. No, I actually agree totally with what Suncast just said, which is that it's... It, it, he was actually agreeing it's with you, but I'll, I'll give him credit. If you think about it. Sorry? It's kind of ludicrous if you think about it. The fact that, <laughs> not, that, that they're doing this re redundant development. Not, not necessarily, because take a look at the crude dragon capsule that just blew up. So now he's got to wait for to figure out what's wrong and then to rebuild a prototype and correct the issue. Whereas if he had a competing team build, he'd just go with that and say, OK, we're going to use that now. So I can see where he's coming from and not just with the capsules. This has been done with rockets before with him where he's changed some of the insides on the rockets and into different blocks, I think he called them. And it's worked out for him because if one block didn't work, he said, well, we fixed that in the next one. And he did. And it just worked well for him to have uh, competing designs. I'm doing a 180 on my position because I actually was completely there thinking it was a bit ludicrous. But when I think about it, you've actually talked about it, SP, before how he does run a risky game. And I think that that's definitely the cards you have to play here. But if you are going to play that risky game, it's better to have a backup. And and he is. He he like SpaceX definitely is willing to go and and push the envelope maybe a bit too soon. And you're that's going to increase your chance of a disaster happening. And so you might as well keep that ball rolling forward. So yeah, no, I actually I've changed my mind. I agree with you, SP. Not only do you have two teams that are building a prototype, you are to have two teams building multiple prototypes. So interesting times for SpaceX. We also have interesting times for a competitor for SpaceX called Blue Origin. And there was another article on Thursday, the 9th of May. We spoke about this the last podcast that I was on. The title of the article was Blue Origin Unveils or unveils Blue Moon, its big lunar lander. And this article went on to say, Blue Origin revealed the first life-size mock-up of its new lunar lander named Blue Moon at the Washington Convention Center on Thursday, May 9, 2019. Now, Blue Moon is designed to carry rovers and other large payloads to the lunar surface, but it could also take astronauts to the moon, said Jeff Bezos. Yes, Jeff Bezos, that same guy who's the Amazon.com founder and is simply the richest person in the world until his divorce is completed. So to modify Blue Moon for a crewed space flight, the company would top the spacecraft with an attachable pressurized ascent vehicle. So he's coming in, Jeff Bezos coming in, swooping in, saying, I'm developing a lunar lander, whereas SpaceX has been developing the big space liners to go between here and the moon or Mars. So interesting competing developments going on in the private sector. What's really interesting when you think about it is you just talked about how SpaceX has a couple of prototype teams going on, right? Blue Origin looks to be just one. So Jeff Bezos could be sitting there and he could say, Blue Moon, you saw me standing alone. And it would be completely factually accurate. <laughs> also, keep in mind that Blue Origin does not play the risky development game that Elon Musk has in trying to push timelines Blue Origin has taken their time to get where they are and to see a spot that is available technologically with a capability of saying, well, yeah, that's great. We can get to the Mars, but how are we going to land there? Well, let's try landing on the moon first. So I think there's going to be some valuable lessons that are learned by Blue Origin by doing this. And of course, we've all heard NASA has their own plans as well. I don't know who's actually going to come out of this, who's going to actually go to the moon, who's actually going to go to the Mars. But it looks like not only these two companies and many others and NASA, but also other countries and their space programs are trying to do the same thing. We have officially entered into the new space race. How exciting it is. It is really exciting because I, I definitely think that it helps us look at things differently and develop faster. I'm really excited to see where this lands. So I've been saying this for a while now. I think we're, we're at, like SB said, we're at a new generation of a space war or space race. 
And I think this is the most exciting time that we've had for space vehicles in probably 15, 20 years or so. I agree with you. I completely agree with you. And I think that this is one of the things that helps fuel more competition and and faster development. Because if you get a couple of big names in there and they start to show it's viable to have this business structure because so much of the world is based off business, now you're going to have more people wanting to do that. And then you end up with more competition and that that's going to develop faster. You know, it, it's it's neat. I like it. Neither of these developments are being really funded by NASA. I mean, NASA's picking in some some monies for the ISS crewed vehicles. But aside from that, these companies are going on its own. And it reminds me, I, I remember if you have not picked up this series yet, it's a History Channel series. I think it's available on YouTube or at least free on their website. It's America, the story of us and the men who built America. Now, I'm not trying to be American centric. But this reminds me of those times of those big names that really built society to where it is now. And I'm talking about Vanderbilt, Carnegie, Rockefeller. Yeah, these are the guys, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and anybody else that can fit in there are now in that venue. Uh, Bill Ga- I would argue Bill Gates and um, Steve Jobs would also be in that list now if you would do that list again. So they these guys, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are in there. And we talked about it before on the cast. Elon Musk is transportation. I think Jeff Bezos is mostly on delivery focus. I mean, it is an Amazon mindset there. So I'm just going to say this. At, at the end of the day, I just wish I had the amount of money the waste that Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk have. The amount of money that they have that they're throwing at this. My God, what I could do with one tenth of that. No kidding. And I think it's worth mentioning, though, what SP just talked about a minute ago, which is that Jeff Bezos may not have as much money anymore. We're not much of a gossip program usually, but, you know, you've commented on that a couple of times. What's going on with that there, SP, with the whole alleged situation? There's no alleged situation. We just don't know the outcome of it yet. Jeff Bezos is getting divorced. And if you take a look at what happened with Sam Walton when he passed away, his fortune, he was the richest guy in the world. His fortune passed to his wife and his kids and his grandkids, and it got dispersed. And then all of a sudden you had not one person being the richest person in the world, but then you had like four or five being in the top 10. And that's one of these situations when you take that wealth and you divide it by two because there was no prenuptial agreement. They each are uh, authorized in American law to have half of the marital assets. And so she's going to have half. Now, whether she allows him to control it or I I don't know how that's all going to pan out, but they're not going to be stupid because they're not going to cut off the nose to spite their face. They're going to want Amazon to make money. But Jeff Bezos has been selling off billions of dollars of his investment in Amazon in order to fund Blue Origin. And this all stemmed, by the way, from uh, allegedly stemmed from some revealed texts, I believe it was, that ended up uh, essentially he was going to be extorted by a certain publication, which we won't mention. And that was because apparently they got a hold of some texts that may not have been good for his relationship. And we'll leave it at that. But here's the thing. If that was the case, even if there was an audio clip, he could have just said it wasn't me as Suncast is about to tell us because of the fact that it, you know, who knows about if evidence is true, right? Suncast. So this is a very interesting story. Uh, it came out today that a uh, AI firm has a clip of Joe Rogan talking about really weird stuff. I mean, and this is Joe Rogan. So an AI machine machine learning company named Dessa has created an AI, an AI that sounds just like podcaster Joe Rogan. You might be thinking it's just clips of Joe Rogan's voice taken from his podcast. I mean, he's gotten about 1,300 episodes, so there's no shortage of clips of him speaking out there. Uh, he says the replica of Rogan's voice from the team that created was produced using a text-to-speech deep learning system they developed called Real Talk, which generates lifelike speech using only text inputs. 
This includes 100% of the audio that was generated. 100% of that was the machine learning the model using only text input. And this includes the breaths, the ums, the ahs, and all other noises. This is pretty amazing. So um, if you want to check this out and you want to like quiz yourself whether you're not, you can actually uh, tell the difference between real Joe Rogan and fake Joe Rogan, the AI Joe Rogan, you can go to fakejoerogan.com. And I'm willing to bet you're not going to be able to tell the difference maybe 25% more of the time. That's really hard to tell. You might be able to tell, but chances are it's it's good enough that it could be easily faked, that you could believe can, it. Can it simulate Joe when he's under the influence? It probably could, because this thing is generating the breaths, the ums, the ahs, and all other noises that you hear in this fake audio clip. Okay, so, so the noises I get, but you have, when you're under the influence you have a different pattern of speech. Your brain is actually thinking differently. So it would come out differently. Well, yes. okay. So here's the so, thing about well, this is... Well, let me, uh, let me say this. So, so the Ambridge's project is to Im improve speech synthesis model. So this is what they're talking about is speech synthesis. And I would categorize, you know, the, the way you speak and how it changes when you're under the influence would fall under speech synthesis. Yeah, and you know, here's the thing. Um, this actually came out a few days ago, and I had a chance to check it out uh, when it did pop pop up on the internet and uh, on the interwebs, I should say. And you know, there was definitely some spots where he did sound a little bit fake. But Joe Rogan also has this weird speech pattern, so I think that it was almost it was really playing with that speech pattern. And because of the fact that we knew it was AI, we could pick that out and whatnot. But with his speech pattern, I think it was a little bit more accurate. Um, it did come across somewhat accurate, but it also did itself a disservice because of the fact that Joe Rogan has a really weird speech pattern. And, and he I, talked I, about really weird stuff. Yeah, he, and he did. And it, it was a really interesting concept. Now, the question is, of course, is this because he's a podcaster and there's so much audio out there? And so to build a speech model for him is a heck of a lot easier than than other people like you know one could argue someone like joe rogan there's way way more clips out there than would be for like you know all of tim uh tim cook or something like that you know like everything that tim cook's ever said because he doesn't do a podcast on a very recurring basis he hasn't been a host of television shows he hasn't been an actor and, and so i think that it would be interesting to see someone who's notable but isn't producing this mass amount of audio that he is easily pulled from. That's what I, I'm interested to see. But someone who does have this out there, if this is true, and it's all built with a model, uh, the future is now. Well, this is very interesting because the engineers of Real Talk freely admit that even though what they've created is super cool, it's also really super expletive scary because yeah. what they're talking about here is that in the wrong hands, the technology could be used to do something like spam calling impersonation, calling your mother or your spouse to obtain personal information, or let's say gaining entrance to a high security clearance area by impersonating a government official, or even worse, let's say, and I could totally see this happening, an audio deepfake of a politician being used to manipulate election results or, or cause social uprising. Well, that could totally happen. Obviously, I did end up... um taking the low-hanging fruit to segue us to the story as we were talking about uh, all of adultery and stuff. I mean, we didn't actually say that. Uh, but the, th the thing is, I think that there is really malicious possibilities here, even on uh, an idea like relationships or an employment. You know, if all of a sudden there's this viral clip of you out there and your employer goes, look, we have a zero tolerance, you're fired. And you're like, but it's fake. By the time you prove that it's fake, which is going to be hard, you're yeah. already fired. I mean, I mean yes, there's, there's, there's benefits to this, but there's also some very serious concerns like we're talking about here. Well, in any case, I look forward to replacing all of my co-hosts on this show. We'll go back to an audio only program. I just go ahead and type it out. Even myself, you know what? I'm just going to replace myself to just be easier to type up some notes and put out a podcast that way. Then, then I don't actually have to spend any time. I don't have to edit because it's going to be perfect from the beginning. There we go. 
audio podcasting is over. Yep. Can you be less Canadian? Why not? I'm sure it can modify my dialect a little bit. Good. Well, the aim, the part of the aim of this is to actually make, you know, uh, uh, these text to speech uh, things that we have, such as Alexa, to be able to uh, sound more natural. Yeah, I think that that's still going to be a while. I do, because I, I guarantee with something like this, there are certain things that they've done to sort of manipulate the, the model. That's my guess. Moving on to our extra extra section here. Guess what? The Sega has added more games to the Genesis Mini. Yes, we talked about this before, how Sega did announce a Genesis Mini, and they have gone and announced additional titles to the previously announced 20 titles, including Mega Man, The Willy Wars, <laughs> Street Fighter 2, Special Champion Edition, Sonic Spinball, Fantasy Star 4, Beyond Oasis, Ghouls and Ghosts, Alex Kidd in the Enchanted Castle, Golden Axe, Vector Man, and Wonder Boy in Monster World. Mm. This console is going to be coming out in September, and there are a whole bunch of other titles that have been announced, but there are still apparently 10 titles that Sega has yet to reveal. I gotta go ahead and say that I hope that Sonic and Knuckles is on there, because I really do think that uh, Sonic and Knuckles is a staple from the era of uh, Sega, and then we better better get Sonic and Knuckles out there. That's the one that I remember. SP, did you ever play any Sega? No, I didn't play any Sega at all. I was wondering if is Hearthstone available on Sega? I'm thinking not, but I hope so. Hmm. Did you ever play Sega Suncast? Oh, I think maybe a friend back in the day had it, but man, that was a long time ago. I just know that I loved Sonic. Yeah, I'm a little disappointed to see that uh, Sonic and Knuckles isn't on there yet. Uh, yeah, I, I, I might. I'm probably going to pre-order this. Um, but really, it, well, you know what? My wife was really into Sega, apparently growing up, and uh, we got the, the Nintendo classics, which were me. So it's, it seems only fair to add that to the. The routine. I got the NES Classic, the SNES Classic. You might as well add this to the full, the mix. Good uh, luck. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, next up, uh, we want to talk about how Avengers has passed Avatar domestically. Yes, according to the box office numbers, Endgame has domestically in U.S. and Canada is what domestically means passed the. Total sales of or, or box office sales that Avatar had previously Avatar had a 761 million domestic ticket sale record, which was the number two domestic sale record. They have sailed past that and it is looking like they may end up eventually passing the number one, which was Star Wars The Force Awakens. I, think, I, don't, I, know, I don't know. I think it might get there. I think it might get I there. I kind of hope they do. It's going to be close. Well, yeah, everybody's hoped that, but I don't know. It's so Star Wars The Force Awakens, which came out in 2015, had a total domestic lifetime gross of nine hundred and thirty six point six million dollars. So it did not make a billion dollars. The hope was that Avengers Endgame was going to make a billion dollars here domestically. Right now, they're at seven hundred and seventy one point four million dollars. That's a large. So this has been out for a while. That is a large gap of uh, just. just do some simple math in my head, see around $160 million. This late in the game, I think $160 million is really difficult to come by in its run with all the other films that are coming out for the rest of the summer. Remember, this was surplanted in the box office. What was it? Not this last weekend, but the weekend before by Pikachu. Mm, that's fair, but I, I don't know. I can't help but think you're going to get another kick up again in another little bit here it seems to be with these big movies like if i remember correctly i think the force awakens did that where it came out it, it went down a little bit and then took off again the hope is that when kids get out of school they'll want to go see it again and again so but maybe by the end of the summer it will now worldwide grosses by the way i looked at the box office mojo in preparation for this podcast avatar sits at worldwide 2.788 million dollars or 2.788 billion actually dollars avengers endgame 
worldwide is sitting at 2.616 billion dollars. That is close. That is worldwide 160 again. So the gap is domestic, I guess. So 160 million dollars is the gap. I think they got that one in the bag. I think it's going to be the number one worldwide movie probably by next weekend. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. And lastly, in the extra extra section here, Google Pixel 3a. It's randomly shutting down. Apparently, there are some Reddit posts about some users who are experiencing a random shutdown on their phone. Uh, data is not being lost when this happens, but it is apparently shutting down and people don't know why. There's been a bunch of different diagnostics people have been doing. Could be software, could be hardware. Who knows? Uh, what apparently has been confirmed is that safe mode is not solving it. I'm interested to see where this goes, but it is something that uh, just goes to show when you get your phone soon, stuff like this can happen. Or, you know, maybe it'll just randomly catch on fire on airplanes if it's a certain other phone. But, you know, you never know. Never know how exactly that's going to happen. Uh, but I, I hope that Google gets to the bottom of this. All right. This one here was a segment that popped into my mind because I thought, hey, Steven, you got yourself two Apple users on the show tonight. For once, there's more Apple interest or representation than there is pixel representation because Chris Farrell is my pixel buddy. And unfortunately, Suncast and SP are not my pixel buddies. Nope. So on the notes of the 3A, what I thought would be a fun little thing for us to discuss here is... What exactly do we think of the concept of the Pixel 3a and possibly applying that to other areas, hopefully Apple? The reason why I wanted to do this was because let's just for a moment forget that article that I mentioned right now about how the 3a is shutting down because we don't know what's the reason is the software. Is it something else? Let's hope for a second that it is software and it's just a bug and, and let's roll with that for a minute. Because you, know, you could have just left that out. I, I could have left that out. But uh, then everybody would be like, hey, you can't have this whole segment because you forgot the most important part. So the 3A is getting... I think the most important part is you uh, uh, talking like an old fart. Oh, fair enough. Well, back in my day, <laughs> we had Nexus phones. Uh, anyways, the Pixel 3A uh, was an interesting concept because it is getting very, very favorable reviews. And this is based off of a whole bunch of different websites saying how the phone seems to balance money with feature sets. Forbes was quoted as saying it's the best smartphone under $500. Android Authority said the phone made for everybody. Android Headloins, uh, Headloins or Headlines if you prefer, <laughs> said the only Pixel you should buy. So... The reason why a lot of people were saying this was because of what I mentioned. There's still a lot of really good features in the 3A, but it costs a lot less. The 3A is priced at $399 US, and the 3A XL, the larger version, is $479 US. Compared to the flagship Pixel 3, which is priced at regular $799, and the 3 XL at $899, that is a remarkable savings. Now, that's not to say that Google is the first to do a light phone. No, we've seen a lot of this before. We've seen Motorola do it. We have seen Apple do it with their XR. But the thing is, a lot of people were touting the features that they kept on the phone and the ones that they chose to remove as not being that essential for some people. Just to give an idea on what this had compared to the flagship Pixel 3, they kept an OLED display on this phone. A lot of the tiers down, get rid of the OLED uh, display, instead put an LCD on it. Uh, they ended up reducing the processor to uh, not the cutting edge generation, but essentially the tier down, which is still a new version of the tier down processor. And some reports are saying that the, t the newest tear down processor that they use the snapdragon 600 series apparently actually does better than last year's the pixel 2 processor which was last year's cutting edge processor 
So that's interesting to see that they went with a previous, uh, essentially a, a level down, but a current version of the tier down. What else they removed from the 3A versus the Pixel 3 was there's no dedicated Pixel photo processor. A dedicated photo processor is something that has been a staple for the different Pixel generations. They went with a plastic body for the 3A versus a glass body on the regular 3. The glass on the screen, while it is an OLED display, they went with Dragon Trail glass as opposed to the staple of Gorilla Glass. There is no water resistance. They did keep dual speakers on the phone, but for some reason, the bottom one is a bottom fire as opposed to a front fire. Really weird thing. They also got rid of the uh, recently added dual front cameras that came into the th Pixel 3 generation and other miscellaneous remove, uh, uh, things that they removed are there's no ambient light sensor. It's only available in 64 gigs of, of storage. The recently brought back wireless Qi charging that we finally saw come to the 3 line is, is removed for the 3A. And the other thing that is worth noting, because so much of Google's infrastructure is based off of trying to get to cloud, they did stop including unlimited Google Photos full quality backup that they were giving away to free in different various forms for the Pixel uh, 1, 2, and 3 generations. Now, here's the interesting part about the 3A is the 3A added back a headphone jack. And when you actually look at the display of the Pixel 3A, the cheaper phone versus the full size Pixel 3, it's actually the uh, a slightly larger screen on the 3A. The 3A is running a 5.6 inch display versus the full fledged Pixel 3 at 5.5 with a uh, different resolution change respectively, respectively being 1080 by uh, 220, 220 pixels on the 3A, and then the, um, the 3 was 1080 by 2160. So a little bit more resolution, and then a slight increase in battery capability on the 3A. It's really interesting to see what they removed, and again, the reason I wanted to room, uh, run this down was just to sort of give an idea of the concept of the 3A and what they chose to do to give a less expensive phone. The interesting thing about this whole thing is that one could argue actually that the Pixel 3A XL is the better deal because it's really not that much more expensive and the XL actually goes and removes that ugly, ugly notch that came into the Pixel 3 XL. They got rid of it in the Pixel 3a is back to just a little bezel at the top. There is no notch anymore. And you know what? I'm very, very happy to see that actually because I hate the notch. I hate the notch. And uh, some are going to call that a con. I call that a pro. So Stargate Pioneer, we'll go ahead yeah. and start with you because for the audio listener, Suncast walked off. Uh, we're not sure where he is. We're guessing he's probably faking some form of dialogue to be posted later on the internet. But I want to go ahead and talk with you and get your thoughts on what you think would be a interesting idea if we were going to see a similar concept applied to Apple. But before we do that, I think it's important to sort of run down the iPhone XR and how that stacks up against the XS because the XR was the discounted version, but they did take a different approach. So I'll turn it over to you to run down sort of what they did when they were coming up with the XR. We've spoken about the iPhone XR before on this program, especially when I was deciding what kind of phone that I was going to upgrade a family member to, actually a couple of family members to. And I did take a hard look at the XR at the time, but it was good to be refreshed as to what the capabilities were because I kind of threw it over my shoulder and ah, that's not the phone for me. First of all, it is priced at $750. So that's kind of a lot, especially in comparison to the Pixel 3 being about half that price. So it is a luxury discount model. And I think we could all agree that the high end iPhones like the SX Max and the SX, they are probably some of the more expensive phones in the generation until whatever generation that they're going to put out this fall. So for a display, it has an LCD display versus an OLED 
display on the high-end XS. The camera, there is no telephoto lens as on the SX, and that is a second lens on the front of the phone, or actually on the back of the phone, the, the front facing or the rear facing camera. It has significantly less re resolution, and that was one of the things that completely turned me off on the XR. It's got uh, 828 by 1792 versus 1125 by 2136 on the SX. So the body is made out of the same material, but the frame is aluminum on the XR versus stainless steel on the SX. So it's glass, but it's different metal that goes into the construction. The water resistance was interesting. It was an IP67 water resistance on the XR versus 68 on the SX. And it only had three gigabytes of RAM versus four gigabytes of RAM. Just want to point out that the Pixel 3a has four gigabytes of RAM. And it does add a 6.1 inch on the XR versus 5.8 inch display on the SX, but at the worst resolution, you're actually getting less of display on the phone. So the XR actually kept a lot, uh, pretty much to the same as the XS, including the processor, it's the A12 processor. The biggest cost savings were the display in the RAM and presumably the frame. So it's definitely two different approaches between the two companies, Apple versus Google. And Google did strip a lot. I was looking at a uh, comparison for the first time today. Google did strip a lot more feature than Apple did, which arguably gets them down more in price. And I, I think one could argue that the uh, XR could appeal to a broader market if people really just don't care about the display. And remember, the display was one of the things that I'm like, nope, I, I need a better display on the phone as I go forward. So with that, Stephen, you posed a question to us. Yeah, I wanted to know if you were, as Apple users, you guys were looking... Oh, I'm sorry. It's the Pixel 3 segment over? <laughs> we're to the Apple section now. Don't worry. We're to the, the Apple section now. Uh, if you guys, as Apple users, were wanting to see a discounted phone, sort of in the concept, the idea of what Google did where they stripped down some features. What would you be willing to get rid of to bring that dollar down? Because the model that they've got now, where the price is so high and there's not a lot of reason for you to upgrade it each year, it's causing people like us three to say, we're gonna wait and we're gonna buy a previous generation because it's gonna be good for a while. And something like the idea of the 3A coming out where it is pretty modern, like it's a modern device, it's a new device, but it's a lot less money. That could be really, really appealing. So let's start with USP. What would you do if you were going to strip down the iPhone? What would you be willing to get rid of to try to bring that dollar down? First thing I'm going to get rid of is that facial recognition. I realize that it is supposedly an enhanced security measure, but I don't need it. And I've seen it not work. My, my wife has an excess and my daughter has an SX now and they both have had issues with the facial recognition in different lights and they're women so their hair can vary from day to day too right so facial recognition is one of those things that really is not needed the other thing that I really don't care about in a phone even if I'm watching video on my phone it, I know it's going to be a degraded experience anyway because if you've got an iPad mini or that sort of screen on up in a tablet that's going to be your better viewing experience. So really the iPhone, if you're watching YouTube's on it or whatever, it's an emergency viewing purpose for me, or like the phone that you or the screen that you have with you. And if you want to see something better later on, and I'll give you a good example. Say you're out at the, on the floor of the star Wars celebration and the Star Wars trailer came out and you can't get into the panel, you're watching it on that little screen. You know later on you're going to go watch it on a bigger screen. So that's what I'm talking about there. Uh, and the front facing speakers or the stereo speaker, I don't care. Just give me a speaker. I just want to hear it and I want to hear my phone calls. That's all. I, I don't care about the the aesthetics of it or the bonuses of front facing or stereo speaker. I don't care. Uh, I, Why I not don't get rid of all the speakers? And just plug in headphones when you want to actually want to hear something and leave it on vibrate. You know what we should do, though? We should make it better so you don't have to worry about actually plugging in headphones. 
Make it telepathic? I No, I was just saying, make sure that you come up with some form of technology so you're pretty much forced to do it wirelessly. That might be a good way to go. But I thought Apple could make this stuff all telepathic so that you know when you're getting a phone call or a text. <laughs> Then they don't. Then they don't need any vibration motors or speakers. <laughs> I have vibration motors. I, I'd be fine getting rid of those. Stephen, it is interesting that you brought up the the plugins. I don't care what they are because Bluetooth is getting better and better and better. And while it's not my preferred method of connection, it is reality. And I'd be fine doing Bluetooth. I'd be fine connecting via USB C. I'd be fine connecting via Lightning. Be fine connecting whatever i don't care whatever the cheapest is for apple to put out there that's the sort of charging plug slash connector that i want on the phone now waterproofing that's interesting and i'm going to put up a 50 i don't care if it's ip 67 or 68 i'll go 50 50 of whether to do that or nothing because it's come in handy for me. If you reference back a few, a couple of months of episodes, <laughs> I actually had mine in a puddle for at, <laughs> at least a half an hour, if not an hour, and it's fine. Versus if it wasn't waterproof, it would have been a dead phone. And uh, so I recognize the niceness of it. I mean, I've heard stories of people dropping their phones in toilets and stuff. I've never done that, but I would hate to have that to happen. But if you're careful with your phone, and you don't drop it in the parking lot in a puddle and drive over it. You really don't need the waterproofing. So I, I say, you know, in a discount phone, I'm talking discount in a discount phone. OK, as long as I have some sort of replacement plan, I don't need that waterproofing. I don't know what kind of cost factor that is to drive up, but I would think that would be significant in terms of fit and seals. Wireless charging. That's another one. I, I don't care in a discount phone. I'll go ahead and plug it in and. I will give you the example of, uh, unfortunately, I found myself having to get a new car this past, it, it, not a new car, used car, whatever, a different car. My car was on its last legs. I, I babied it as long as I could possibly. Uh, can I get more out of the car? Yes, but it's prohibitively expensive now. And it's just not worth my time and money. So I had to go out and get a new car. We would test drove a bunch of different used car models. And we finally ended up getting one, and, and this will probably be for a future segment. We got one with CarPlay in it, and I've been using Car CarPlay in this particular car is capable via the lightning connection into the phone and not via Bluetooth. So as you know, as long as I get the connection into the car, that's great. Do I need that wireless charging? Do I need that wireless capability into different uh, interfaces, as long as I can hard plug in, no, I don't need it. Once again, this is a discount phone. If I want the wireless options, I'll go pay for it. And the other thing is I don't really care how heavy this is. I don't care how big it is. I don't care how small it is. I could go back to the iPhone four fit form <laughs> if it would save significant amount of money. It, if I wanted a phone for 200 bucks, give me that size. If it would work, I'd be fine with that. So I don't care about weight and size if I'm going discount there. Now, the things that I definitely would keep, and unfortunately the XR did skimp on, the better cameras. I'll give you an example of what happened this past weekend. So my youngest daughter graduated from high school this past weekend. So we had all sorts of graduation festivities. I was taking pictures with multiple different phones. I notably had an iPhone 5. I had an iPhone 6. I had an iPhone 8. I took pictures with my iPhone 8 uh, eight plus and the XX maxes by far the better pictures. If you're going to have a camera and the best camera on you all the time is going to be your cell phone. The best pictures out of that bunch is the SX max. Mm. Those were beautiful pictures on, even on my phone pictures that were backlit and turned out a little fuzzy or light washed out on my phone on the SX, they turn out perfectly. And it was the same settings on the phone. And the other thing that I found out is my phone has portrait available on it. The SX Max has portrait available on it. The eights and below do not have that portrait mode. That portrait mode actually gets you really good pictures, facial pictures. That's what it's for. And yes, so I would like to keep the better picture because it's going to be the one that you have, the, the camera that you have on you. So I would need that. 
Before you and, go on to your next point there, yeah. I, I I agree with you entirely. And I actually had that in our notes and I skipped over that. And that's one of the big selling points why P, the, the 3A was getting favorable reviews because Google apparently continued to do good processing while the processing took a little bit longer because they didn't have that that CPU, uh, dedicated CPU. It still was producing really good pictures and a lot of people were saying as comparable to the Pixel 3. So obviously that it, that is... A, I think there's a lot of people that probably agree with you. If that was the priority that Google did for the 3A, I think a lot of people agree with you that the camera is a very important thing. We want to keep having mm -hmm. those cutting edge cameras. If we're going to buy a camera right now or a phone right now, we want it to be pretty much the best camera that we can get right now. I mean, if your choice is a really good camera on a cell phone and a really good mirrorless for $1,000 a mirrorless camera. I'll take the really good cell phone camera because I'm going to have it with me all the time. I don't have to worry about charging a second mm -hmm. thing or a big bag. Even though the mirrorless bodies are really small, a big bag to carry around a second camera or whatever. Uh, and you're going to have to spend that money. So let me spend the money in one place. Yes, I do know that mirrorless cameras are a lot better than what you can get in a cell phone for a variety of different reasons. Lens changing, not the least of which. But yes, camera is a big factor. Another big factor that you could probably argue with me is storage. I want the largest storage possible. And I could see the argument of I give me less storage as long as the cloud storage was available. I think that's how Google does it on the pixels. But I want the largest storage available. And I also want a good battery. I want it to last all day long. I don't want to have to run out and find a charger every two hours because if I'm stuck on a plane and I want to play my, I don't know, game, uh, Solitaire, Candy Crush or whatever they, they're playing <laughs> on the phones these days. Uh, uh, Final Fantasy. OK, I've got Final Fantasy uh, one through four on my phone right now. If I wanted to play that on a plane ride, I want it to last the whole plane ride. So, uh, yeah, I, I need a good battery. So, yeah, that's the pros and the cons. And I don't know if my sacrifices are enough to get an iPhone into the Google 3A price range. I, I agree. I think when you look at what uh, Google has removed versus what your list is, I think you wouldn't be down that, but you would be down. I think you would be down to the point that you would significantly consider it if you were buying tomorrow. I think that you would still see it shaved quite a bit off from the XR because so when you, you think, think about like maybe 549, I don't know. That would be, I, I don't know how Apple would set their price, but I think the, the key things that we're looking at what he's removed is going to be the waterproof. He's saying 50-50. Let's go ahead and say he's removing that. That's a okay. big, big difference because now we're into plastic bodies, which is probably the way it's going to be because you're not, you're not commenting either way on bodies. So you're probably in a plastic mm -hmm. body as yeah. well as the weight and size. The size factor is going to allow you to use a little bit different parts and maybe a little bit bigger. Uh, and also, I think the facial recognition is something that probably changes the... con. Basically, the camera that's needed on the front and the technology that's needed, uh, whatever that technology is that they use on the facial recognition. So I think that there is definitely some things that could shave it down here. You didn't comment about processor. Um, what What's your thoughts on processor? Would you do the sort of last, basically last year's era? I think last year's era would be good enough on okay. the processor. But I don't know if I would go further back than that, just because we see these things get bogged down really quick within 18 months of release. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. How about you, other iPhone user, Suncast? What sort of things would you do for yours? Well, I think SP pretty much covered most of it. Um, I think one of the only other things I would change is just doing a plastic body. Mm -hmm. I think that's where you're going to have some significant savings as well. Instead of having an all metal or all glass or all steel frame, just have it plastic. And I think that's where you're going to have a lot of savings. I agree with you. I think the frame and the, or, or the body and everything is a really weird thing that the industries have done is go to this really fancy glass or whatever it is. And is it for the waterproofing? I guess maybe part of it. But the thing is, when you think about from the perspective of it being a visual thing, how many phones that you see out there aren't in a case, right? Like there, so many of them are in cases. I, yeah, I mean, I don't understand why the, the back has to be glass. If it's going to cost me more money, I'd rather just have it plastic. I agree. Or I can... I'd, I'd rather save $100 or whatever it is in having a plastic back. 
Do you know what I still think was one of the nicest phones for me to hold was my Nexus 5 because it was like this rubbery sort of texture on on I think it was a plastic case, but it was just it was really nice overall. It was practical if you chose to go caseless and otherwise like it was really easy to clean. Like I I think that there's all sorts of money savings there. You know, for someone like yourself Suncast you are somebody that does when you you upgrade. I think the last couple of upgrades you've kind of done current. What is your thoughts on the processor? Would you be willing to sacrifice cutting edge processor? Because like that's the big thing that the XR was like waving their flag about. Apple was waving their flag about the XR was it's still the modern processor. It's still the cutting edge processor in the discounted model. I think you would have to in order to get the price down. Okay. And and do you think that that would affect your potential to buy it if you went like a year old or or a generation down, but cutting edge generation down? Mm, I don't know. No, I really don't know. Yeah, that's just, that's just not something that I, I, I would have to give more thought about it. And I just don't know. You know, one of the things that I think is worth noting um, with the differences between the two models is with the XR, they went current CPU less ram google did less processor less cpu same amount of ram i'd probably want more ram than anything else mm -hmm. yeah and that might be that's gonna make a big difference and and maybe that's why they could get away with it on the pixel because you know the processors aren't exactly apple to apple comparison either because of the os and a whole of, bunch of other factors but i thought this was a really fun interesting thought exercise and i like what both of you said here and i think that it definitely shows that there are things that we're willing to give away like we we wanted things to evolve and evolve and evolve and then we got to the point where they increased the price significantly to keep evolving and we're like okay we can go back a little bit here. We we don't need all these anymore. We're willing to to have less features for less money. And so maybe we'll see that happen. And and whether it was um like uh, truth be told, I actually really hope that the XR was going to take off because I thought that was a really good opportunity us for us to explore that discount line again. And I don't think it really did. And so I am hoping the 3A problems get fault solved and that the 3A takes off just so that we can continue to explore this discount line. I would love to see more of that happen from more manufacturers without it being the Moto X line. Like the Moto X line had one good, good generation and then the rest were just like dog slow and terrible. So I want to see this happen. I want less expensive phones, but keep those cutting edge ones for people who are willing to spend the money, but give those of us who don't necessarily want all of those bells and whistles an option all right well that's gonna go ahead and wrap it up for this show before we close let's just give sp a moment to plug and promote and do whatever you would like to do because i started off with suncast promotion i guess i should give you a promotion opportunity too oh cool do, do i get a raise with that promotion no why would i do that well it's i mean promotions are usually given with raises mm, okay i might double your pay all right, uh, we'll take that under advisement. Anyway, <laughs> we had a couple of things happen in my shows recently and just want to state them. We had the Arrow season finale, which was You Have Saved the City, the final episode of the seventh season. We did a podcast on that. It was released a couple of days ago. It actually has uh, received some acclaim from the creative team of the show. So I'm pretty proud of that connection right there. So you can check that out. Even if you haven't watched the show in a while, it actually got really good this past year. So that final episode was really cool to get out. And on my other show, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., so that was Starling Tribune, by the way. On Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., we had the premiere episode of Season 6 of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which was a really fun ride. There's been two episodes out, so there'll be another episode of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. out. But if you want to catch the premiere episode, that podcast is available right now. And it was just a fun time with all four of us. We had the three lady agents. They're all agents now. And me on there. And it was lady a fun show agents. indeed. Yeah, that's right. And I'm fine with that. And 
I am furthermore fine with the season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Unfortunately, it's only going to be 13 episodes. If there was one bad thing about this season, it's only 13 episodes. And then se season seven is also going to just be 13 episodes. So it's it's uh, almost just like, OK, why didn't they call it season six A and B? I don't know. Well, on that note, I just want to say that uh, I will I'll be kind. I'll be nice. And I will say that after the arrow, what I've dubbed to be the series finale, which is not the series finale, but I've dubbed it to be the series That's finale. Fine. I've um, been there. Yeah. Uh, I definitely appreciated you guys doing your episode so quickly after you actually recorded it on the Tuesday after it uh, aired, which was on the Monday. And I needed the therapy. I, I needed the therapy because it was completely different than I anticipated. And I really, really, really appreciated being able to sit there and watch you live stream it and just chat with you. And uh, really, really just dissect that episode. So thanks for doing that show. I know that it's been a rocky road in some some areas. So I really appreciate you being there as an outlet for me. Yeah, I'm just glad I'm not a Game of Thrones <laughs> podcaster right now. So, oh my gosh, <laughs> that, that series finale was something else. I mean, you could like it or hate it, but it's it's been very controversial. And then I know that we said it before, but I just want to say a congratulations to Chris Farrell. He got married and he is off doing married things now. So congratulations, Chris. Take a couple of weeks off. We'll see you back in, I don't know, July. All right. Well, congratulations, Chris. So on that note, for episode 287 of the official GunnaGeek.com show, I'm Stephen John Drew. Or am I Stephen John Drew? This might all just be an AI. And I'm SP. Chubby, 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 chubby. I don't have any lines to go right here, so chubby, tell a tubby. Do you spend all day <laughs> thinking of these closings? <laughs> I just don't even know it anymore. He's available at gfqnetwork.com. Go write your hate mail over there. Bye. See you guys next week. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for checking out another episode of the official gunnageek.com show. If you like the show, please give us a five-star review in Apple Podcasts or a thumbs up on YouTube. You can always join us for our live recording sessions, which stream Mondays at 8.45 p.m. Eastern at www.geeks.live. And remember, you can find our full back catalog at gunnageek.com forward slash show. If you're itching for more geeky content, check out other shows on gunnageeknetwork.com. Voice work was by Emily Prokop of the Story Behind podcast. That's it for this episode. We hope to see you back again next week.